this read our preparation God's word today. Let's read together, please. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Lord, may I hear and receive your word today. Today we begin looking at chapter 2. Just to search the Ephesus, we have several objectives we want to accomplish as we go through this chapter. Um, and we get those objectives. Let's look at objective number one. We want to just read these objectives together. Let's read. To consider the riches of God's grace towards sinners, how we are saved by the grace through faith. Objective number two. To understand the Gentiles' condition outside of our hearts. And objective number three. To understand the effect that Jesus' death had on the law and what Gentiles can now become in Christ. We have just finished looking in chapter one. Paul <coughs> began the letter with a great section of praise to God as it was summarized in verse number three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He then proceeded to unfold what those blessings were by showing us, first of all, that the Father had chosen them in Christ before the foundation of the world, verse four through six. And then he went to share with us how the Son had redeemed him, redeemed them rather through his blood and made known to them the mysteries of his will for the ages, the summing up of all things in Christ, verses 7 through 12, and how God had sealed them with the Holy Spirit of promise, verses 13 to 14. Lest we forget... <coughs> Three times in this text, Paul says, he ends each section with the phrase, to the praise of the glory of his grace. God has redeemed us for his glory. And then in verse 15 to 23, Paul shared his constant prayer for the Ephesians, that God may grant them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, this was the very heart of Paul's prayer for these saints, was that they may know God better. Paul prays that his readers might grasp more fully the hope into which God had brought them by his call. He prays that they might understand that those who trust in Christ are the glorious inheritance of God. Then he prays that we might understand what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Paul was praying simply that God, <clears throat> that he would make known to these Christians the tremendous power that was there. He wanted them to understand the power of God. It was the power of God that had raised Jesus from the dead and had seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above all authority and power. And then as we sought to close out that chapter in verses 19 to 23, Paul takes us to the heights, exploring the power and the authority of the risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ. And now when we move into the second chapter, verses 1 through 3, he's going to take us to the very depths he ended chapter 1 by taking us to the very height of the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. Now we move into chapter 2. We're going to go to the very depths. Paul expounds the powerless, hopeless, lifeless condition of fallen man. Man who has been enslaved by their own fleshy desires dominated by the world around them. Though verse 23 ends chapter 1, we have to remember 
that these chapters and verse divisions were not a part of the original letter, but they were added much later so that it would make, us, make it easier for us to read. So we must be careful how we look at the context of these words that Paul wrote. Paul goes on to tell us how God's great power has worked in Christ for our behalf and how we partake of that particular power. Was, cru was Christ crucified? Yes. When God made us alive with him, was Christ exalted? Yes. And God has raised us up with him. Was Christ seated next to the Father to rule? Yes. God has also seated us with him in the heavenlies. The power that was exerted in Christ affects us directly. We are the beneficiaries of God's power and love for his son. Now the first seven verses of chapter 2 form once again one complete sentence. This morning, I just want us to look at the first three verses. They paint a very dark and depressing picture of what all of us were like before God made us alive, the way we were. Verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. I memorized this verse in the King James Version, which adds, the phrase, has he quickened after the word you. And if you have a King James Version, you will notice that this phrase is in italics, indicating that this phrase is not found in the original manuscript. The phrase has quickened us, however, is found in Ephesians 2 and 5, and we'll look at it more in depth when we get to that verse. But in our text, Paul begins by describing the past sinfulness of the Gentile believers as indicated by the word you. Most see this word you as referring to the Gentiles of Paul's audience. But we must understand that the you here is in universal in scope. Everybody who ever lived, everybody who ever was born except for Adam and Eve, were born dead in trespasses and sin. He simply describes the condition as you were dead. And in the next verse he says that they were walking in the course of the world. So they were what I would like to describe as dead men walking. The phrase dead men walking was used by correctional officers in the American prison system years ago when the warden would lead a dead man on death row down the hall to his execution. And he would lead him declaring, dead man walking. This phrase was looked upon as being cruel and unusual and therefore it was outlawed by the civil rights activists. This is an idiom, an American idiom, dead men walking. It has somewhat been broadened in its definition somehow to other types of situations that describe doom. Even doom in the losing of a job or, or as one gets a bad report from a doctor who says your days are numbered. But in our text it is more, much more serious. Paul is saying that they and all men alike are spiritually dead while being physically alive. They were up and moving around, but they were dead. Jesus made this distinction in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 22. Matthew 8 and 22. Matthew 8 and 22. Can you click it for me? Matthew 8 and 22. The scripture says... But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Now obviously physical dead people can't bury other physically dead people. What was he saying? Let the spiritual dead then bury the physical dead. When Paul says that they were dead, he means dead. Do you understand that? He means the cessation of life. 
This is what we call an absolute statement. It doesn't simply mean that they were in danger of death. To be dead is to be lifeless. To be dead is to be unable to help oneself. To be dead is to be absolutely powerless. To be dead is to be beyond any hope, apart from the supernatural. As the, the late, great John Calvin said, this is a state of real and present death. Those who deny God's sovereignty and our salvation have to redefine what it means to be spiritually dead. Above all else, they want to avoid the conclusion that it implies an inability because if sinners are spiritually unable to believe the gospel, then salvation must be totally of God and not at all due to man's free choice to believe. So they argue that spiritual death only means being separated from God. That it does not imply the inability to respond in faith and repentance to the gospel. Physical death is an inability to respond. That's physical death. No matter what the stimulus is, physical death means one cannot react. You and I, we've been to enough funerals and so we know about physical death. It doesn't matter what the stimulus is. No physically dead individual ever reacts to any stimulus outside of the supernatural. Spiritual death, then, is an inability to respond to the things of the Spirit. The very picture of being dead and the need for God to impart new life strongly implies a lack of ability on the part of the dead sinner to do anything to affect his own resurrection. If you remember when Jesus was standing by the grave with his beloved disciple and he cried out in John chapter 11, 43, Lazarus come forth. Lazarus didn't exercise his free will to come back from the dead. He arose simply because Jesus had imparted life to him. That miracle was a picture of what Jesus had to say earlier regarding spiritual life in John chapter 5 and verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. And then Jesus will go on to say in John 5, 24 and 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Spiritual resurrection is the only solution, saints, to spiritual death. By saying that we are spiritually dead, Paul means the kind of deadness that requires a resurrection. So when he says dead, he means dead, not weak or sick. There was no superficial solution to this problem. It really took a spiritual resurrection to save us from our state of sin. If you have any spiritual life within you, you simply owe it to the sovereign voice and power of God. Now notice what Paul is not saying. He is not saying that we were handicapped. <clears throat> he didn't say that we were sick. He didn't say that we were misguided by our social surroundings and our communities. He says we were dead. We were without any spiritual life at all. That is describing us before we came to Christ. There was no spiritual life at all. There are many analogies that people use to depict man's sin that are simply not biblical. 
morally evil man must take the medicine of the gospel in order to live. Many say that man must make the choice. He must take or he must decide to take the medicine. Well, the problem with that analogy is that the Bible doesn't speak of morally ill man. It speaks of man being dead. I guess you understand the difference of being mortally ill and dead. The scripture clearly teaches that we were dead in sin. Notice what the word of God says in John 6 and 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus repeats this in John 6 and 65. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless he has been granted him from the Father. Now notice the words, no one can. Notice those three words, no one can. In these two verses, they mean that they are unable by themselves to come apart from God's powerful intervention. They are spiritually dead until God imparts new life. In John chapter 8 and 43, while contending with these uh, supposed religious Jews, Jesus says, why do you not understand what I am saying? Is it because you cannot hear my words? Now, obviously they could hear Jesus' voice, they wasn't spiritual, they wasn't physically deaf, but he was talking in reference to their spiritual deafness, meant that they were incapable of hearing Jesus' words in the sense of responding favorably to those words. So spiritual death includes being separated from the Holy God because of our sin, but it also includes being spiritually incapable of responding favorably to the truth of the gospel unless God raises us from spiritual death to spiritual life. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 3, we see this famous passage coming forth regarding the deadness of Israel in their sin. We read, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. That was us. We were dead bones, dry, having no life before we came to Christ. And when we see ourselves as such dry, dead bones, we too should be asking the question, can these bones live? Mm. No, the answer is not apart from a supernatural resurrection that can only come from God. Amen. And then the, then the prophet went on to say in Ezekiel 37 and verses 10 to 12, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your grave, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. God is talking to the physical Israel through the prophet Ezekiel. They say their bones are dried up and their hope is gone. They weren't saying that they were physically dead. They were separated from God. They were out of the land. Now, according to Jewish writings and the Jewish traditions, any time Israel was outside of the promised land, they considered themselves to be dead. Life for them was in the land that God had promised and that where God dwelt. God said he was going to open their graves. He wasn't talking about physical graves. 
because they wasn't physically dead. This is talking in reference to spiritual resurrection. The point is the unsaved, those who are outside of Christ, are compared to dead men or even to dry bones in their entire helplessness. In this, they are all alike. God's choice of some to eternal life is as sovereign as if Christ were to pass through a graveyard and call one another to come forth. The reason for restoring life, one to life, and another leaving in the grave is only found in God's good pleasure and not in our dead selves. Believers, please understand this. Believers, please hear. As far as salvation is concerned, we bring nothing to the table. As far as salvation is concerned, we bring nothing to the table. You don't even bring yourself to the table. We're dead. If we are to be saved, it will be because of God. It will be because of God who through his supernatural assistance has overcome our deadness through the power of the resurrection. Paul says we were dead in trespasses and sins. This is what is called in the Greek language a locative of spear. It is talking about the spear in which they live. The wording is not because of your sins. It is a location of position. The opposite of being in Christ, what Paul is saying, is being in trespasses and sin. Either you are in Christ or you are in trespasses and sin. If you are not in Christ, then you are in trespasses and sin. The word trespass means here to slip, to fall, to stumble to go in the wrong directions, to step over the line. The word sin here means it's, it's used as a hunter's word, a term that hunters use. It means to miss the target, to miss the mark, as a man who shoots an arrow would miss the target. God uses these two words, trespasses and sin, to describe fallen man. And both of them are in the plural. To show the totality of sinfulness that is the result of being dead. Paul now describes the character of the pre-Christian life in three different perspectives. I want you to get this. In verse 2, he uses the characteristic of the world. Verse 2, he also uses the characteristic of the devil. And then in verse 3, he uses the term the flesh. In the second verse, he says, in which you formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now let's break this down. This is a condition of one outside of Christ before salvation. Notice the phrase, in which you formerly walk in which you, he's talking to his Gentile audience, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. The word course here means age. The word world here is cosmos, and it means a system, the system. It means a custom of society, the custom of the culture. So Paul recognizes here that sin was cultural. How many other examples do we have in the Old Testament of a corrupt society leading in increased sinfulness? And it seems that Paul is saying that we can look at culture and see that culture leads one to sin. You can see this all through our culture today. Teaming up of an individual's moral corruption with promoters and, and supporters of that corruption through marketing, which makes escape from that corruption harder and harder. Because everywhere you go, we see signs and billboards that continue to bring back the corruption to our mind. Religion is the opium of the people. This is a simple statement, a classic statement by Marxism. It's a classic also statement regarding American materialism. 
We know that from the books of Acts that Paul's audience lived in an in -in idolatrous culture. And so do we. We do not want to determine our culture as being idolatrous. We want to be able to function in our culture and like our culture and yet proclaim that we are good Christians and we are where we need to be. Not understanding how our culture has an effect upon us and how if left by itself will lead us into sin. Well, they weren't the only ones being influenced by the culture. Notice what he goes with. According also to the prince of the power of the air. Now, among the Greeks and Jews at that time, it was a current, it was a current opinion of that age that our atmosphere, the atmosphere of that age, the air, were the special abodes of spirits. It's where the spirits would reside. The word prince here is a word which means first in rank or power, a ruler, chief ruler. This is no doubt referring to Satan himself. He is called the ruler of demons in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, Paul calls him, they do not come to trust because the God of this world has blinded their minds in order to prevent them from seeing the light shining from the good news about the glory of the Messiah, who is the image of God. When you read John 12 and 31, John 14 and 30, John 16 and 11, Jesus called him the ruler of the cosmos, the ruler of the system three times. We see that this prince influences men to sin. Acts 5 and 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? In other words, Satan worked in the sons of disobedience, not only to blind them to the glory of the gospel, but also by filling their hearts with a desire for evil. Repeat that, repeat that, Pastor. Satan works in the signs of disobedience, not only to blind them to the gloriousness of the gospel, but also to fill their hearts with extraordinary desires for evil. Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 22, verse 3 and 4. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And Satan entered into Judas. Satan entered into Judas and conferred with the high priest, the chief priest and the captain, how he, Judas, might betray Jesus. Satan is also further characterized in this verse as, get this, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. A couple words here I want you to take note that will help give us clarity of this particular phrase. The first one is the word working. This word working, and it always denotes supernatural power. We're already seeing this word used in the first chapter, verse number 11 and verse number 20. Notice that the text says, that is now working. Notice the, the present condition of the words, that is now working. Now this now in the text is not our now. Hopefully you understand that. It was the now of the first century. It was the now of the first century. You know, one of the things when I think about the charismatic movement, and, and there's still such strong evidences of the charismatic movement in many of our well-intentioned Christians and believers, and even some of you who are listening to me now, do not really understand the dangers of the charismatic movement. Many times when we think of charismatic movement, we think about speaking in tongues or people like Benny Hinn knocking people out and things like that and people with prophetic words and utterances. But there is an underlying danger in the charismatic movement and it has to do with their preoccupation with Satan and their preoccupation with demons. 
See, the common myth is that Satan is the source of all of our trials, problems, and difficulties. Let me say that again. There is a common myth that Satan is the source of all of our trials, problems, and difficulties. You remember back in the late 60s, early 70s, Flip Wilson had to say, the devil made me do it. More recently, Andrea Yates, the mother that killed her five children, said the same thing. She said that the devil made her do it. It's the devil that causes all of our problems. But what does the New Testament teach us about dealing with demons today? Y'all got, got to hear me. You got to hear me. You got to hear me. What does the New Testament teach us about dealing with demons? Nothing. The New Testament teaches us nothing about dealing with demons. Does it tell us to call the exorcist? Does it tell us to call Roman Catholicism and perform an exorcist? No, it doesn't. Are we told to go around pleading the blood? No. Don't reduce Christianity to a bunch of hocus pocus. The New Testament teaches very clearly that the devil and his demons have been defeated and had been destroyed by the work of Christ. You don't hear me. Amen. Hebrews 2 and 14. I let scripture talk. Hebrews 2 and 14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Amen. He had it, but don't have it no more. Amen. One of the aspects of Christ's earthly mission was to destroy the devil. The Greek word for destroy means to utterly become idle or useless. To abolish, to cease, to destroy, to do away, make of no effect, bring to naught. Was Christ a failure in his mission? No, he wasn't. But most of us Christians act like he was. <laughs> we still worried about the devil. What are you doing? What are you ain't doing? What are you doing? He's here. He's there. He's in the car. He's in the washing machine. He's in the hub. The devil, the devil, the devil. I believe many of us want to, to stick around so we got somebody to blame for our sin. 1 John 3 and 8 says, 1 John 3 and 8 says, the one who practices sin is of the devil. I wish I had some people here who believe in Scripture. The scripture will answer all these questions. Amen. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But the Son of God appeared for this purpose. What was the Son of God here for? To destroy what? The works of the devil. Amen. The word for destroy means to loosen, mm -hmm. to destroy, to dissolve, to put off. Christ is said to have destroyed the devil and his works. My question then will be to you, do you believe the Bible? Colossians right. 2 and 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. According to my Bible, Satan is a defeated foe. Amen. Jesus has already conquered the devil. Amen. The Lord Jesus accomplished what he came to do. And I believe the book of Revelation is the story of that accomplishment. Satan is no longer the God of the age. Jesus has already taken the keys of death and hell. Yes. Yes. According to Revelations 1 and 18 for Bible readers. Chapter 12, the devil stands before the woman to devour her son when he's born, and he is called up to heaven to the throne of God. There is a war in heaven, the word of God shares with us, which Satan loses, and he's thrown down to earth. He knows that his time is short, so he then goes and persecutes the woman and her seed. We must understand that the destruction of Satan and the coming of the new earth, the heaven and new earth, are concurrent events. Satan is destroyed when, when God comes to set up his new kingdom. Revelations 20, verse 10 and 11. 
And the devil who deceived them from the throne, who the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it from those whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. <laughs> the devil is defeated. Amen. <clears throat> that was the other phrase in that verse. Sons of disobedience. <coughs> Sons of disobedience. Now, I want you to notice the word disobedience because it gives us, it gives us the wrong idea. The Greek word that's translated disobedience here has more lending to the word unbelief. Therefore, this is not denoting anyone who simply disobeys. It is lending itself to the unbelievers who do not put their trust in Christ for salvation. Do not put their trust in Christ for salvation. Not one who just simply disobeys. Paul says in verse 3 of our text, Among them, we too, all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now we already may know this, but I want you to see it again in verse 1 and 2, the pronoun you was employed. But in verse 3, Paul changes to we. <coughs> The you in verse 1 and 2 was no doubt referring to the Gentiles. The we, too, refers to not only Paul, but to the Jews. It's interesting that here, that Paul chooses to unite both the Jews and the Gentiles in this common condition of sin and death. It's one thing for Paul to have said these words concerning the Gentiles, because no Jew would disagree with him. But Paul says these things now about the Jews. Because the Jews thought that they were born special. The Jews thought that because of their physical connection with Abraham, that they were better than everybody else, and especially the Gentiles. It was written in Galatians 2 and 15, this thought that they had about themselves, that we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. This self-righteous attitude, this self-righteous claim of the Jews, is not only challenged by Paul, but Paul reverses it when he writes, Among them to all formerly, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. What does he mean, among them too, we all formerly lived to the lust of our flesh? Well, if we want to get to the root of sin, if we want to get to the root problem of sin, we need to look at what Paul says is the third cause of our death, of our being dead. He just given us, he had just given us two causes for us outside of Christ being dead. Anybody remember the first one? Uh, no, that's not the first cause. The first cause. The first cause of, 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 of us being dead. He's given us two already. I've talked about two of them already. The first one was the world. The world. The world. What was the second one? The prince of the devil. The prince of the devil. The devil. Now he's going to attack the third one. The third one. The third one. This is not talking about the world. He's not talking about Satan. People often ask, if Satan is defeated, why then is there still evil in the world? Where, they ask, does evil come from? Got some interesting scriptures here. <laughs> Got some interesting scriptures. Isaiah 45 and 7. I'm going to get to the flesh in a minute, but let me just go on to a trail here. Isaiah 45 and 7. The scripture says, The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. I want you to notice in that text the word calamity comes from a Hebrew word that's better translated evil. Now, just the allusion to say that God causes evil, most Christians will have fits. Because most Christians don't study the word of God and understand the nature of God and what God is trying to do. But the whole Bible is filled with this idea. Evil is something 
that if not all Christians, the majority of Christians totally associate with the devil, not God. God allows it. God permits it. If you examine every instance of this Hebrew word in the text, you will notice beginning at Genesis 65 and other places in Scripture is translated wickedness in the Old Testament. And as we move out of Genesis and move into the other uh, passages in the Old Testament, it renders itself sin as distinct from its punishment. For instance, when we read over here in Amos chapter 3 and verse 6, if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity, that's our word, occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? God is the one who is in absolute control of everything that happens, both the good and the evil. i got to say that again. God is the one who is in control of everything, not some things, everything. Amen. Whatever Satan does is because God allows him to do it. Amen. God is in absolute control of everything, both the good and the evil. Amen. God is sovereign. Now you may be asking, why then does God decree this? Why then does God decree this? I believe there's a response in Romans chapter 9, verse 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now, Paul's focus here is on the great patience of God who keeps back his wrath from those who deserve his judgment. Paul's argument emphasizes that the only thing that is not fair or just is that God has acted in mercy to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known. How does God make his power known? By the judgment of sin. Sin then provides a means for God to be glorified. People think that we need a devil for men to sin. But James put it another way. James said in James 1 14, but each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. James says that sin comes from our own lust. It is my opinion that sin is part of the human constitution. This is what Paul goes on to tell us that they were by children, by nature, children of wrath. They were born with a nature to sin. The word nature here means by birth. They were born with this nature to sin. Paul says in Galatians 2 and 15, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. We are born Jews. Born, they were born Jews. All men were born children of wrath. Notice what Paul says in Romans 2 and 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. Now I believe this is a very misinterpreted verse. Many see this verse as saying that God has written on the heart of every man a basic moral good code. That code is similar to the things contained in the Ten Commandments. This universal moral code consists of things like do not steal, do not cheat, tell the truth, honor your parents, keep your word, help the poor, do not kill, and so on. Those who proclaim this thought believe that man is born with this code. One commentator writes, he has written his moral standards into the human DNA so that even the remotest tribal groups understand something of God's law. I had to ask myself, is that true? Do all men know God's law? I don't see it. I don't see it in scripture. I don't see it in human history. I don't see it in human nature. From what I understand this verse in Romans is the proof verse for this teaching. Many take this verse to mean that Gentiles by nature do some things the law requires. They take it to mean that there is something inside the heart of man that compels him to keep the moral standards that God has laid down in the Ten Commandments. 
the Ten Commandments. The key to understanding this verse, I believe, is the translation. All the major translations have missed it here. And their mistake has led to a faulty view of the innate knowledge of God. The phrase, by nature, goes with the possession of the law, not with the doing of the law. Those who do not have the law by nature or by birth are Gentiles. And these Gentiles do not have Old Testament. Yet do the Old Testament, do the Old Testament refer to these as being Christian Gentiles? No. Most Christians believe that personal sin comes from indwelling sin. Most evangelical Christians believe that personal sins come from indwelling sin or man's sinful nature that he inherited from Adam. I don't believe that man inherited a sinful nature when he becomes an adult. I believe that an individual inherits a sinful nature when he's born. He's born with a sinful nature. He's born with this sinful nature that he receives from Adam that can only be dealt with as he becomes one in Christ. Therefore, leading Paul to write in Romans 8 and 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. It is through our union with Christ that we are no longer uncon that we are no longer under condemnation. That we are no longer under the wrath of God. It's when we are united with Christ. There is no more spiritual death when we are alive in Christ. But we still sin because we are still in our human encasement. But thank God, because we are in Christ, we are no longer under the law of sin and death. Adam's sin brought all men under condemnation. Paul says that we are children of wrath. Before they became Christians, they were children of wrath. This Hebrew expression means that they were characterized by being under a holy God's wrath against sin. While many of our modern churches scoff at the notion of God's wrath, that God would have a wrath, it is a concept that occurs hundreds of times in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, especially in the final book of the Bible, book of Revelation. This is, what the, this is what the text teaches us. John says, John says, I'm going to skip the, uh, the text is in Ezekiel. I'm not going to read Ezekiel 12. Um, I'm just going to move on to my next point. Baby. Okay, so he says here, let's sum up what we said. I, I hope you, he says that, first of all, he says that you were dead in trespasses. What did we say trespasses were? Means cross the line, means slip, stumble. Anybody with me today? Yeah, yeah. We're set, trespassing the sin. What do we say the word sins mean? It's, it's the mark. You say you were dead. What do we mean by you were dead? Dead, 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 dead. Spiritually dead. Okay, you're talking about spiritually, you're talking about spiritually dead. What else did we say about dead? Being dead. Is the inability to respond spiritually. No life. No life at all. No life at all. This is the way we work. Anyone outside, it don't matter how much they expose themselves to spiritual things, how much they come into spiritual atmosphere, come to church, be a part of activities, if they are outside of Christ, have not accepted Christ as their Savior, as their Lord, they are dead. They cannot connect to spiritual things. There's no need of you reading the Bible to them. It makes no sense to them. There is no connectiveness to them. They must become spiritually alive. They must be united with Christ in order for this book to have any meaning to them. So we must be praying that they come out of this deadness, and only God can do that. 
in which you formerly, speaking to the Jews, walked. And the word walk, walk means conducted, how we conducted ourselves. We walk according to, now using three aspects, what were the three contributors to this deadness? Well, he says number one is the course of this world. The world has a system. The world has a course. This cosmos has a way of living. Our culture is entwined with the world. Number two, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Say that. Say that. Brothers and sisters, be careful how you decide to allow the culture to influence you. The culture influenced us in our entertainment, our, our, our modes of dress, our opinions regarding politics, education, health, whatever, whatever you name. Our culture is intertwined with the system of this world that is controlled by the mindset of Satan. Some things you should not be exposing yourself to. You can get rid of it out your mind. It plants a seed and it's there to corrupt the righteousness of God. Yeah. To take away your desire for more of God. Yes. The desire of the system that's run by Satan is not to bring you closer to God, but to repel you from God. We get, in, we get involved in these cultural issues and, and these cultural ways of entertaining ourselves because it makes us feel good and we like it and we, we don't, what we don't understand. That's what our flesh is designed to do. We were born with a flesh that automatically gravitated to a system that was outside of God. That's why Paul had to bring his flesh under subjection, under the power of God. Oh... Well, I knew these three verses were going to be dark and we wasn't going to be all excited about this because it speaks about the way we were. And, and, and as we really look at this, we really still entwine ourselves with this. We, we would be totally surprised at how much of our lives are dictated by the course of this world. Amen. We pick and choose that which is of Christ that we want to partake and take on. If, if that which is of Christ don't fit my particular niche, or my particular liking, I don't want, I don't want that. You're being too religious. You're being too, too, too much of a Christian. It don't take all that. You're going too far. That's our excuse so that my flesh can overpower me. And not understanding that the court of this world and the prince of this earth operates through my flesh to keep me away from God. Amen. Amen. Course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now, I hope you put a word there beside disobedience. It's not really translated disobedience, but it's unbelief. Those who do not, those who refuse to believe that Jesus is the Savior. Among them, we too, we too, we too. Paul includes himself now and the Jews. All, this will all men, all men. This is how we formerly live in the lust of our flesh. Indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature, what? Children of wrath, even as the rest. Let's fill in our outline. The old condition. We were all outside of Christ. We were spiritually dead. We were walking in trespasses and sin. Make sure you understand what trespasses are and what our word saying here means. This is the way we work. Are you going to be good? All who are outside of Christ live under the power of all outside of Christ live under the power of the world. We live under the power of the devil. And we live under the power of the flesh. And make sure you can you have a distinction. When we're talking about the world, we're talking about what? Uh, the system, the world system. Make sure everybody understands what we mean like the world system. All right? Uh, uh, we are under, uh, those who are outside of Christ operate under the power of the devil. 
Now remember that the devil works in the he, he works under the in the boundaries that God allows him to. Then we all outside the, all who are outside of Christ live under the power of the flesh. This is what each of us have as Christians that we battle with. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the devil, and the flesh. The world, the devil, and the flesh. And both of these seek to work through here. This is the only way these two can affect us. It's the flesh. We who are Christians, the world, the devil has control of the world, and he seeks to incorporate the world system, the world's values, as it operates in our flesh. Get our flesh stirred up here. And what the purpose is to get us away from God. Cause us to think independently. Cause us to work independently of God. All who are outside of Christ are by nature under God's wrath against sin. Because we are in Christ, because we have believed in the finished work of Christ, God's wrath is no longer against us. It's no, no longer applicable to us. Have any questions over these first three verses? Now, 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 these first three verses explain basically what we were before we became Christians. And all of you here who are Christians ought to be able to explain to someone the way we were. It's not talking about some folks. It's talking about all of us. Before we became Christians, that's the way we were. Very much led, driven by our flesh. Very much led by the system of the world. Now, the point is, now that we're Christians, we should not be driven by our flesh. Amen. Now that we're Christians, we should not be driven by a culture or a cosmos that is anti-God. Mm -hmm. It's sad to say that we live in a country that is, that is very close to the borders of an anti-God, an anti-God establishment. Even in a lot of our churches, they call themselves evangelical churches. They're very borderline anti-God. And how we need to pray consistently for a spirit of discernment to be able to discern, to be able to discern, to be able to discern what I'm watching. What is his purpose? Is this a system? Is this a system working in my flesh to take me away from God? We need to be able to discern our associates. Is, is this group that I'm hanging with, is this something that's drawn to me to take me away from God or to bring me closer to God? People, places, and things stir up in our flesh. We like it because it makes us feel good. It's entertainment. It entertains us. As a believer, our goal should be coming more and more like Christ to be vessels that God can use as we're learning in Wednesday night that we can mature and be a greater effectiveness while we're here on earth and serving the Lord. I want to be all that God wants me to be. And I don't want to be half Christian and half in the world. And I don't want to explain my, my worldliness or my fleshness. I don't want to explain it away as simply saying, this is the way it is. There is a power that he spoke of in verse 23 of Ephesians 1 that's in us now. That's why we spent so much time last, last week talking about that power, that power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that ascended him to the right hand side of the Father. Is that same power now that works in us? Because we don't have to be carnal. We don't have to be worldly. We don't have to lean in that direction. We can be all that God wants us to be. Amen. It's our desire. Where is it that we want to go with this? Any questions?